you in the oral history collection for the UAH Space Archives. I'm Charles Lundquist. Today, February 12, 2006, we have Ed Buckby. Ed, thanks for being here. Nice to be here, be here with you. To get started, can you please give us a brief summary of your career, where you spent your youth, where you went to school, and how you got into the space program here in Huntsville? I uh, grew up in the hills of West Virginia, the Shenandoah Valley, and <clears throat> went to school at uh, West Virginia University. I also was uh, uh, a member of the ROTC, the Reserve Officer Training Corps there, and I graduated with uh, a degree in journalism, marketing, and uh, a commission in the United States Army. And that uh, has caused me to become interested in uh, the military. In fact, that was my plan to, to follow the military <clears throat> as a career. And I attended the uh, uh, Army's uh, public information school, and then I found out I was going to be uh, assigned to Redstone Arsenal, Alabama. And that was my introduction to the Army, uh, the missile program. In fact, uh, I'll have to go back and, and reflect on uh, one evening that I was working on the school paper. And so happens I was the editor that night. We put out the school paper at West Virginia four days a week, the Daily Athenaeum. And it was all done by the journalism students. And I happened to be on the desk the night that uh, Sputnik was launched. And I remember the machine going off, the U UPI machine going off and all the bells ringing. And I knew that <clears throat> there was something going on in the world that was was very different because I'd never heard the machine go off with that many bells before. So uh, lo and behold, the announcement was that uh, the Russians had launched, first it, they said uh, some kind of a bomb. And, and, and Sputnik was not in the vocabulary book, as I recall. In fact, we didn't know how to spell it. But we, uh, we called the uh, dean of school and we figured out uh, eventually how to spell it, Sputnik. But it was, it was a frightening experience because, um, you know, in my day, uh, we, were th we thought that the Russians were basically tractor drivers and had no technology uh, uh, abilities or capabilities, and that was a, a real shocker. And I remember immediately the teachers in my, in my classes began to say, young man, you're going to have to study hard, and you're going to have to work harder, and we're going to have to have more engineers and scientists to, to go after these Russians and, and beat them uh, at what they're trying to do. So that was kind of a... Uh, introduction that I had to uh, what was happening in the 57 58 time frame and then when I came to Redstone I was assigned to the, the post Redstone Arsenal the post of Redstone Arsenal command and immediately was uh, uh, introduced you might say to the the fire and smoke uh, project of Warner von Brown <coughs> was that I arrived here in <coughs> excuse me in 1959 and uh, I uh, began my career, and in fact, my, my plan was to uh, be in the Army and stay in the Army as a career officer, uh, but I, I learned uh, quickly that there was some exciting things going on uh, here at Redstone, <clears throat> and many of my friends were uh, resigning their commission and going to work for the Army, and in fact, some of my friends were here as, as military guys uh, and working in the labs, and they, when they left the Army, became a part of the ABMA and the Army organizations, ARGMA and others. So about the time I was uh, getting ready to decide whether to uh, con continue my military career or do something else, I, I realized that uh, the, the Von Brown team, about 5,000 of them as I recall, were being transferred from the Army to, uh, to a new agency called NASA, which was uh, my introduction to the space program and the space agency. And I had followed that uh, effort of Saturn uh, as it was conceived from an ARGMA program, uh, ARPA program rather, and, and as, as you know, it was really a, a, a brainchild of Von Braun when he was uh, in the Army. I followed that program and it was, it was pretty obvious that they were going to do something pretty, pretty impressive with that big Saturn rocket. And I, I remember re a, feeling it and hearing it being tested uh, when I, because I lived on post and uh, we, we would uh, occasionally uh, find the, 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 the building shaking and, and, and vibration and shock waves and so forth going across the complex. So I got very interested in that and so I resigned my commission and in 1961 uh, I went to work for the Marshall Space Flight Center in the Public Affairs Office and uh, I worked there uh, through the 60s and had an opportunity to uh, be involved in the in the Saturn Apollo program and, and was around all the guys that uh, 
made it happen. And a lot of my American friends uh, turned down jobs in other parts of the country uh, to stay here and work uh, in, the, in the space program. So that's how I got started at, at the Marshall Space Flight Center. Very good. How long were you there with Marshall then? I worked at, until 1968. <clears throat> and in 68, uh, there was a plan uh, that Mon Brown really was the was the, the conceiver of of built to build a a space and rocket center, and I was asked to go on, go to that project and start it in 1968. So I started working on the uh, space and rocket center project in '68. Actually, I was working on it before that as a as a, a a team member. A lot of people were involved in it, and, and Bon Brown, of course, was was the father of that project. And I was asked to go there and work, and I actually was on loan. And uh, I, I, I opened uh, the, the museum, the Space and Rocket Center, in 1970. It was my intent to go back to, to Marshall. And lo and behold, I found that uh, they had not found a director, and, and they asked me to stay on, and, and I decided to, I, to do that and left uh, NASA and became a full-time director of the Space and Rocket Center. And, and I ended up staying there 26 years, a lot longer than I ever planned. But I had a, a great opportunity to uh, market NASA, to talk about the Marshall Space Flight Center. In fact, we uh, we opened up a bus tour of Marshall, and it was like uh, you know it was like the the showcase of of Marshall Space Flight Center, and it and enabled me to stay in touch with the program all through Apollo, all through Skylab, ASTP, and of course uh, the shuttle program. And so I was basically doing the same thing I did as a NASA employee. I just happened to be outside the gate at a, at a building where I had all the, the, the fun uh, toys to uh, <laughs> present to the public. And, and then that was, uh, that was exciting to uh, be able to, to tell that story. And, and, and Bon Brown stayed involved with, uh, with that project after he left in, in 1970, went to Washington. He, he would come back on a continuous basis and kind of check us out to make sure we were uh, doing things. And uh, he was, I know he was the guy who uh, uh, came up with the idea of uh, we ought to have a tour of Marshall Space Flight Center. And let's, let's take people out there and show them what we're really doing today. Because here we're looking at the history of the center at the museum. We need to show them what we're doing in the future. So the bus tour uh, grew out of that. And then, uh, of course, uh, he's the famous uh, guy who came up with... Uh, well, why don't we have a, a camp for kids to study science? He told me one day, he said, you know, we have all kinds of camps in this country. We have band camps, cheerleading camps, uh, golf camps, but we have no science camps. And he said, maybe we should look at that. And sure enough, we did. And a few years later, we opened uh, Space Camp, and it's now, uh, you know, going on 25, 26 years. And I understand... Uh, Five five hundred thousand, a million, a half a million people have experienced one of those programs since it opened in 1982. So it was a, an interesting time for me to uh, be able to uh, be involved in the in the project, particularly during the Saturn Apollo uh, moon landing program, and then follow it on through through the shuttle program. During the early days when you were at Marshall, uh, there must have been lots of excitement in the public affairs offices. The various satellites went up and Project Argus and so forth. Do you have any recollections of that of interest? Well, you know, I've often been asked, uh, you guys at the Marshall Space Flight Center must have had a, 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 a plan of action, a, a, a program of work to attract all of that attention and press coverage. And I have to tell you, we had no plan. We, we were basically reacting to the request. Uh, it was... Uh, a typical week, for example, in the public affairs office would be we would have a, a Warner Cron a Walter Cronkite a TV crew at the center. Uh, we would have uh, uh, a documentary crew uh, from public broadcast. We'd have a, a foreign uh, crew from Germany or France, uh, five or six writers, science writers from um, national publications, Life magazine. Uh, Mag Paris, the Match ma magazine from, from various places. A typical week would be involving those kind of people, and they, they came to Huntsville for three things. One, they wanted to uh, 
kick the tires of a Saturn rocket. Uh, secondly, they wanted to go out and see a, a firing of a Saturn rocket. And third, they wanted to interview Warner Van Brown. And basically, that's what we did. Uh, we, we were the reaction, uh, we were the people who took care of the request, and, and we, we re, you know, we responded. And it was, uh, you know, it was throttled to the floor uh, constantly in, in being able to react to the people who, who were so excited about what we were doing. And I think that was uh, triggered <coughs> probably by Jack Kennedy's visit. That was a huge day for us in the public affairs office. And it, it, was, a, it was a big day for Von Braun. Uh, because at that time, when he came here in, in the 61-62 uh, time frame, he actually came two times. The, one, the, the first time he came, there was no other place to go to see what was happening in the Apollo Saturn program. Here's a man who had given NASA its purpose in being. It, it gave, he gave us a mission. And in fact, uh, we referred to him in those days as NASA's president mm -hmm. because he was the guy who put us on the map and said, look, we're going we're gonna to go to the moon, we're going to beat the Russians, and we're going to do it within this decade. And consequently, he came here, I believe, to, to really see for himself how we were doing because he was hearing from the politicians in Washington and he was getting this sort of so-called mixed uh, message that we might be able to do it or then we might not be able to do it. And he, he came and he, he flat out asked Von Brown, are we going to be able to do it within the time frame I set? And, and Warner Von Brown told him, yes, sir, Mr. President, we will do it and we will do it within the time frame you set. The most exciting time for him was when Kennedy stepped up on Heinberg Hill and, and got behind that little bunker and watched Saturn engine firing. He, he, he did not know what to expect, but when he when that thing it, it was firing, you could see it, you know, a little bit of uh, nervousness, and then when it stopped, he grabbed Von Braun's hand with both both hands and shook, shook his hand and, and said, Dr. Von Braun, that was wonderful. That's the most exciting thing I've ever seen. He said, I could feel the shock wave uh, hit my face. I could feel it my, my, in my chest, the diaphragm, and I, I even uh, felt heat come up my pants leg. And he was so excited about being able to experience that giant Saturn machine test firing. And I think uh, that really convinced him that he was involved with people who knew what they were doing. In fact, he invited Von Braun to go on Air Force One with him to the next stop. And we, uh, we sent Von Braun's uh, overnight bag and briefcase on another airplane, and they caught up with each other. But Von Braun told us later that, that Kennedy asked questions about the, the, the business of how we're going to go to the moon, how long is it going to take, are we really going to find any problems on the moon? You know, in those days, there were people speculating that the spacecraft would sink, you know, into the, yeah. the lunar surface and we would have all kinds of problems. He was asking those kind of questions. And, uh, you know, it was, it was interesting to watch these two men, two entirely different careers and professions, yet very much of a visionary in, in both of their areas who wanted to do something significant. And to see them come together and, and, and see that chemistry work and find that, that they, they really did acknowledge each other and if they appreciated the ability that each person had. And I'm always, I've always been astounded at uh, the ability of Von Braun to, to adjust to the political system and, and the way we worked in this, in this country. Uh, he, he was able to understand how to make it function and how to participate as a governmental uh, agency, as a government employee, how to function in this strange world uh, that we call in those days the space agency. And I, I think uh, he, he, he conquered that quite well and he certainly taught us. He was a great guy to work for as a communicator. I mean, very seldom did you ever have to tweak or, or coach Warner Van Brown. Uh, he had that, that marvelous delivery, a great accent, uh, good looking guy, and on camera he was, he was superb. And uh, hardly ever did we have to say uh, to Dr. Van Brown, and of course we never called him uh, Warner, we called him around, around the office, we referred to him as VB, as you probably know short for Warner Van Brown, but Dr. Van Brown was what we always, you know, called him, but uh, hardly ever did we have to, to coach him. He had the best sound bites 
of any individual I've ever been around, and, and that includes a lot of presidents and vice presidents that, that come, came here over the years. And that's why the press enjoyed him. In fact, he would, we would send him to press conferences and where his boss, Sam Phillips, George Miller, and his boss, Jim Webb, would be on the stage. One of them, Brown, would get all the questions. And that became a problem for, for us in the public affairs office. After uh, many of these press conferences, we get a call from our public affairs boss in Washington and say, look, Ron Brown gets all the good questions. You know, his boss sits there and gets no questions. <laughs> and we, we, we can't have that, you know. And unfortunately, it, it, it got to the point where Von Brown was not invited to some of the press conferences the later, in the later days of the Apollo Saturn program because the press wanted it wanted to hear what he had to say about that flight, about that particular mission. Mm -hmm. The other problem we had, a lot of the foreign correspondents came here thinking Bun Brown was in charge of the entire NASA program. And we had to go through um, uh, many uh, changes of titles and, and you know, lettering on, on speeches and so forth because it was just assumed that he was the, the head guy of the whole thing. But he was, uh, he was a marvelous guy to work for. Uh, he never missed the opportunity to thank you, uh, as you know, for what your contributions. And in those days, uh, it was late to bed, and early to rise, work like hell, and advertise. Right. You mentioned that President Kennedy came twice. Any recollections about his second visit? You know, he came here the second time to visit TVA, uh, the uh, Tri-Cities area. And the reason he came to, to Redstone was that's the only airfield that he had uh, where he could land the, the big Air Force One. So he landed at Redstone, and uh, Von Brown met him that day, and uh, uh, he, he helicoptered over to the, uh, the Tri-Cities area. And I think, as I recall, the, the visit was primarily to uh, understand what TVA was doing, and they, they had some, uh, as I recall, experimentation going in in fertilization, uh, some kind of work going on in that field. And he had not been, apparently, uh, in, near a TVA operation before, so he came for that purpose. He did not, he did not come into the Marshall Center. Uh, on his first trip, he, he visited the Army. He stopped at one of the labs and uh, visited some of the soldiers in the school and, and spoke, of course, at Redstone Airfield. But he was here about four, four and a half hours that first visit. The second visit, he, he was probably here six to seven hours, but he spent most of his time over in the Tri-Cities and flying back and forth. And the other thing I failed to mention, uh, Von Braun got an invitation uh, from he and, and the First Lady, Jackie Kennedy, to come to the White House, to Dr. Von Braun and Mrs. Von Braun, to attend a dinner. And unfortunately, that invitation was uh, the, the week after the President was assassinated. And unfortunately, that occurred, but that invitation came uh, before uh, all that happened, and uh, the Von Browns were planning to go. Uh, the other thing I, I recall is my friend Alan Shepard uh, referred to Jack as the astronaut's president, because right after, Ken, uh, right after Shepard flew on our first man-rated rocket, the, the Mercury Redstone, in 61, like th three weeks later, Kennedy made the commitment to go to the moon. And we only had 15 minutes of space flight, and it wasn't even orbital. Mm -hmm. As we reminded Shepard, uh, he, didn't, he didn't make orbit, he only made suborbit. Uh, but Shepard said that, that Kennedy invited them all, all the Mercury 7 and their, and their wives, to the White House. And he was so excited about the fact that we had finally accomplished uh, a manned mission and he, he really believed that we had an opportunity and he said Jack Kennedy asked him time and time again are we going to be able to catch up to the Russians are we going to be able to pass the Russians and that was really big uh, in, the, in that day we, we tend to forget that today but it was a true race uh, of one nation against another in, in, in the technology field and so the Mercury astronauts played a big role in that and I, I've talked about that in my book, uh, The Real Space Cowboys, when I interviewed all the astronauts. Yeah, why don't you tell us a little more about your book? I had that on yeah, the list of things oh, to ask you to talk about. It. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it, it was, a, it was a, a labor of love after a while. As you, if, if you've ever written anything, you know, it, it, you begin to wonder, why did you start this? 
But actually, the book started as a conversation between uh, Shepard, me, and Wally, Shara. And it was a joke at first. And, and, and Shara said, uh, you know, I've got all these stories, some of which are uh, Alan Shepard's lies that I would like to put down in, in a book, and I'll, I need somebody to help me. So I said, okay, I, I've got stories too. So we decided to write this book. Well, Shepard unfortunately passed away in 98. And we had this a lot of stuff, and, and, and Wally said, well, let's just write the book and dedicate it to Alan. So that's what we did. Uh, we, we wrote this book called The Real Space Cowboys. And, and, and the reason we call it The Real Space Cowboys is because uh, there was a, a movie out one time called The Space Cowboys. And it was about these old guys that NASA brought back to fly a mission, you know, and, and try, to, try to fix it and make sure they could go. To, and they did, and they, they, they successfully completed the mission. So... Shepard said, well, or Wally said, why don't we just call it the Real Space Cowboys because, you know, we, we were the first ones. We were, we were out there on the edge and all that. So, in, in fact, they were the, they were the guys who were the boldest and, and, the, and probably wanted to go higher, faster, and, and uh, further than anybody else. And that's why they left the aviation world and test pilot world and became astronauts. They all wanted to go to, go to the top. So he said, we're, we're really the Real Space Cowboys, and that's, that's how that book got the title. So we, uh, we sat down, and, and I had interviewed about 32 astronauts after I looked through my, uh, my work papers to develop the space exhibit here and the Astronaut Hall of Fame in Florida. I would worked on that project. So I had, I had all these interviews and, uh, on tape and a lot of vid visuals, and I had uh, all of Shepard's home movies and all of his uh, gotchas and roast films. And then I had Wally's uh, stuff as well, so we decided to write the book, and it, we wrote uh, about, I used a lot of their interviews, the actual interviews. I didn't have to go out and ask anybody what they said. I, I, could, I actually had in front of me their comments, what they, what they felt about the Saturn program, what they felt about Von Braun and so forth. So I was able to put that in, in the book. And then I, I did a, a, a couple chapters on Von Braun. I, I, I really enjoyed that part where in August of 69 he presented the Mars mission to the space task group and you know as you know nothing happened uh, but I looked at that presentation and I used a lot of that and Wally is he, he, he had not seen that Wally Shroy had not seen that hmm. and he was so enthused and excited about that he said you know we ought to put that in a book because nobody remembers that Von Braun had proposed that we would go to go to Mars in I believe it was 81 82 time frame land you know lift off 81 land 82 using the Saturn V technology with a nuclear upper stage mm -hmm. so I I'd, I'd forgotten about it too so I, I dug out the, the material and sure enough had had pre presentation in fact had the testimony you know of von Braun so we put that in the other thing we added <clears throat> was Gene Cernan who's a friend of ours last man to walk on the moon was one of the few astronauts to ride the Saturn V two times. So he, he has a chapter in the book where he describes what it's like to ride the Saturn V twice. And that was, that was a, a nice addition. And then we have a DVD in the back. And on that DVD, there's an interview of Von Braun in a car in a station wagon going to the airport. I'm driving. I remember the interview because he came to town. He was at headquarters. This was about 71, 72. And he was at headquarters. And he, he agreed to this interview. And the problem was he, he didn't have time to go into a, an office somewhere. So he calls me and said, uh, there's going to be a, a TV reporter or a cameraman meet, meeting me at the museum. And we'll, we'll do the interview on the way to the airport. I said, okay. So <laughs> sure enough, cameraman gets in. I, I get in the station wagon. I'm driving. Cameraman gets in the seat beside me, the passenger. The interviewers in the back seat and Von Brown is on the other side so the cameraman shooting across the, my shoulder and, and getting Von Brown and we go to the airport sure enough the interviews going on along, along the way and it, it was a you know typical interview of, of Von Brown what do you think about what's going on today how about the future but he he covered one thing in that interview that I I think is probably one of the few times Von Brown said this and the question was, would you like to go into space? And this was sh shuttle days. We're talking about pre, you know, b about the time the shuttle was ready to be developed and thought about. And uh, Von Braun said, yes, I'd like to go. And it's, it's the only time that I, I could find him on film, on camera, saying, I want to be an astronaut. 
And that was a nice piece that we were able to find. And the other things we got in there is, a, 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 you know, the astronauts, uh, Wally says that uh, levity is the lubricant of a crisis. <laughs> Meaning, I'm going to play jokes on you, I'm going to play pranks on you, and they, they certainly did that to each other. So every time we had a, an anniversary or whatever, they, when they recognized the astronauts, they would basically have a gotcha. And he'd either run a videotape, uh, they'd stand up and have some ridiculous sign or some award, and they would present this to each other. And the one that uh, I recall, and it's, it's on the DVD too, in fact, there's several of, of them on there, but the one that's uh, pretty different is uh, it's, it's about Shepard. It was his fifth anniversary. And remember now, he's only flown 15 minutes, and, and he, of course, he went on. Uh, uh, he, had, he was grounded for 10 years because I had, had a, a middle, medical, uh, medical problem. But once he came off of the 10-year uh, 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 non-flight, he was selected to go to the moon. So here's a guy, 15 minutes of suborbital flight, and he gets to be a commander on a moon mission, and he takes two guys with him, or rookies. Well, they give, they give Shepard a hard time over that, as you can imagine. So the, the title of the gotcha was Alan B. Shepard, Hero, space hero, how to succeed in business and hardly ever fly. And that's the title of the gotcha. And of course, Wally produced it, and it's it's a fun uh, story of of Shepard. And of course, it it makes fun of him uh, crashing airplanes and all, doing all sorts of things. But um, yeah, the book is, is was fun to do, and we've uh, Wally and I do a, a book signings all over the country. We've, in fact, I'm going to California this week to do a book signing and. And we've, we've had a good time with it, and he, he enjoys uh, telling stories, of course, uh, that, uh, that are in the book and so forth. But, you know, there's only three of the Mercury guys left, John Glenn, uh, Scott Carpenter, and Wally. And they're, you know, they're in their mid-80s, and uh, it's, you know, we miss, uh, we miss those early, early pioneers, and we're losing them uh, pretty rapidly now when you look back through that early group of uh, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo astronauts. About 32 of them participated in those days. So it was a fun book, and uh, we, we, we may do a sequel. We're talking about it. Any comments about John Glenn? We here at UAH had the good fortune of having him as our experiment uh, executor when he made his, his last, last flight. So we got interact with him quite a bit from UAH, but what thoughts have you got? Well, John was always um, the dean of the Mercury guys. Uh, the others, of course, uh, did not. Alan and, and Wally were very competitive. They were all competitive. I mean, uh, they uh, they voted for themselves yeah. any time there was a vote. You know, they didn't vote for John or yeah. Alan. They voted for themselves to go. Uh, but, you know, I, I, re I re recognize that they really looked at John as being uh, kind of the, the unspoken dean, chairman of the board, so to speak. Uh, and I, I noticed that with Shepard when, when there would be decisions made about what the Mercury guys would do in, in, in the scholarship foundation that they formed and so forth. You know, they'd talk about it and, and, and yeah, I said, we're going to do this. But Alan would always kind of check with John uh, before they made a final decision. And I think, I think Glenn... Uh, being a Marine was a little a little different for him. Uh, he was the only Marine. The rest of them were Air Force and Navy. And I think uh, it was a special relationship uh, that developed in the latter years. They they really uh, acknowledged John as being somewhat special. I'll tell you a couple stories. Uh, one was uh, when John ran for president. Of course, he uh, he was not successful, and he had this big debt. And so he gets the guys together one day and, and said, look, I can't use my own money uh, to pay off this debt because of the election law, so I'm going to need your help. And uh, Sh uh, Shepard stood up and said, okay, John, we'll help you as long as you agree. Never, never to run for president again. <laughs> that, was, that was their answer to him, asking for funds. One day we were in Washington. In fact, uh, Shepard had been asked to come up and testify for Space Station, and he did a great job. He, we. He testified on behalf of the station uh, uh, team, and then he went around and visited several of the senators and congressmen. So 
we were in the, in the building where John's office was, and he said uh, to me, so why don't we just go in and say hello to John? I said, well, okay, but we don't have an appointment. He said, don't worry about it. So we go in, and the, the first gatekeeper uh, doesn't recognize Shepard, and you know, immediately stops, and he just walks right by her and goes to the second gatekeeper, who does recognize Shepard, and, and, said, and, and Alan said, is, is John in? And she said, yes, the senator's here. Could we see him? And she said, well, let me, sit, let me check. Well, Alan just walks straight through and you know, <laughs> on in and opens the door into the senator's office. Of course, there was a staffer in there, and they were, you know, John said, don't excuse us, and so forth. And we go in, sit down. We talk about um, the station and uh, you know, talk about some of their buddies and, and what they're going to do the next time they get together. About that time, uh, Shepard looks down at his watch and said, oh, man, we got a, we got a flight to catch out of the National Airport in 20 minutes. John, you mind driving us out there? And the uh, senator says, no, not at all. So <laughs> get up, go down, get in the car in a, in a special parking area, and John Glenn drives us out to the airport. And we get out and say goodbye, and takes his hand and drives off. And I said, Shepard, do you... Do you realize what you've done? You, you got the senator, United States senator, to drive us to the airport. He says, Buck Bean, don't worry about that. He says, that's something that John will remember all of his life. <laughs> <laughs> but that was just, the, they always had, uh, you know, things that they would do to each other. But there was, a, and, and, and of course, Wally never understood how John got a ride on show. Uh, that was something that uh, intrigued all of them. How how he ever pulled that off? Because they were a bit jealous. There's no question about yeah, it. Yeah. And, and of course, when when you ask Wally, uh, would you like to go in, instead of John? And Wally's answer is, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to get that across that John's the oldest yeah. of the team. But they did. Uh, they finally uh, commended commended him. And but for a while, it was it was like. You're taking some young astronaut seat. You 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 should step aside. This this you're too old. You can't do this. And so, but they finally realized that he was do doing it for other reasons and, and experiments. Of course, that he conducted were very productive, and he did a great job. He did. So he really did. He got to fly uh, after all those years. Yeah. And so, when you look at the Mercury guys, you had one moonwalker and one shuttle rider. And, and that's that's pretty unique when you look at the seven guys and where they came from, what they accomplished, and uh, you know they still get my vote as as the the unique group of space flyers that we have all these years. That group uh, still probably the most unique seven men that we we've had in that business. Another colorful character was Deke Slayton. I just saw in a news release that there's a a ceremony being put together somewhere in the Midwest. For him in the next few weeks. Any yes. Comments about Deke? You know, Deke was uh, Deke all the time. Deke, I, I never saw a different side of Deke Slayton. At, at for many years, he was the guy making the decisions. He and in fact, he he decided who got the seat and which seat they got. Commander, lunar module pilot, command module pilot, and he he pretty well single-handedly for a while. Shepard also was involved in those decisions. He selected the people to go to the moon. And, I, you know, I think he is to be commended for the selection process because he had a lot of guys to choose from, and he could have made some errors, you know, in, in, in selecting the wrong guy going here and there. But he had, a, he had that, that knack for understanding what a person could do and how they could perform and how they could carry out missions and when you talk to Deke you got the straight story there wasn't any, it was straight from him and he never he never mushed words or never made made like uh, well this is politically not, not correct or whatever you you got the real story from Deke and one of the things I I'll always remember about him he he told me one day I was introducing uh, Shepard, and I, I think I called him uh, a former astronaut. And when I sat down, Deke leaned over and he said, "Once you're an astronaut, you're always an astronaut. Once you're a baseball player, you're always a baseball player. Why do we call each other former?" And I, I never will forget that. He says, "You know, we're still astronauts. We did our thing. We're that's our profession. We should not be an ex profession." And that was an interesting comment. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he really, he had, he'd say things that, 
you wouldn't expect people to say. He, 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 of course, the press loved him because he would blast, you know, most anybody or anything if it didn't sound quite right. And uh, one of the things that he uh, he taught me uh, about was uh, we should be proud of our record in manned space flight. And this was after Challenger. And we had only, you know, we had only lost uh, the Apollo crew and the Challenger crew, 10 people at that time. And he, he said to me one day, he said, you know, if we had, he said, I thought, and most of the Mercury guys thought we would lose at least one, possibly two crews on the lunar missions. We would probably lose one crew on the moon. Good chance. Mm -hmm. And we were prepared for that. And he, he convinced me that we should be proud of our record of man flight. Uh, when, and, and now when you look back on it, 144 flights, 17, 17 men and women lost. Uh, that's it. Over 45 years. That's a, that's a tremendous record. I think. It is. It's it just amazing. <laughs> and, and he said to me, he said, if we had... If we had been asked in the Mercury days, well, what can we expect? He said, we would have used a test pilot guideline. And they were making black smoking holes in the desert almost every week. Yeah. He said, we would have used that as our guide on space travel. And we would have lost, you know, literally hundreds of people over a long period of time. He said, we, we just should be thankful that we've been so, so fortunate. And he says, because people paid attention. Made sure their their product their their their, their work was correct, and they, they they were conscious of it. We had the manned fl space flight program, uh, awareness program, and so forth. But he he was one to say we shouldn't pick on people for having some involvement with this 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 accident or something because it's not it can't be one person. This is an organization that puts these things together. It's a huge organization, four hundred thousand people involved. And we've been successful all these years. You know, and he said, look at the Russians in the early days. You know, they had all sorts of failures. And, of course, we do ours right out in front of everybody. And, you know, we, we invite everybody to come watch us. And if we make a mistake, it's, it's the world knows it. So he was, he was one of those people that made me feel better about our, our accidents. And, and one of the things that I should tell you uh, about that uh, has to do with Apollo 13 And NASA looked at that as a failure in my day. In fact, Jim Lovell was, was not invited to many of the anniversaries of Apollo missions. Because, really? Absolutely. He wasn't a moonwalker. So in the public affairs world, Apollo 13 was a mistake. It was an accident. And, and consequently, it was not talked about or presented as a part of our overall Apollo success. Tom Hanks comes on the scene, and Hollywood presents Apollo 13. All of a sudden, America realizes, well, this was NASA's finest hour. So all of a sudden, Jim Lovell and his crew become a hero because they were a part, and Gene Kranz, the flight director, they were a part of a tremendous techno technology accomplishment by NASA. But in our world, in the public affairs area, in, in the NASA family, we looked upon that as a failure. And, and consequently, we did not handle it very well until Tom Hanks got a hold of it and, and made, made it understood. It, it presented it tremendously uh, successfully, and, and people realized, well, gee, that was a tremendous feat. And it was. So sometimes you're so close to the program, you don't realize how it should be presented. And the public certainly has has found that Apollo 13 to be a very uh, admirable uh, program and, and mission, and, and we were able to save those guys. But I, I was kind of surprised guys like Slayton and Shepard talked about the fact that uh, we, we would most likely lose uh, one crew on the moon, possibly another one en route. And, 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 and Slayton told me he felt that's why senior management canceled the last three Apollo moon landings because 18, 19, and 20 were canceled. And one of the reasons was they did not want to take a chance. And you know, we were, we were sending pink slips out to people yeah. all over the yeah. agency and the contractors. When Apollo 17 went off, 
we were sending pink slips to people. It was their last day on the job. So I think there was a concern in top management that we could have a failure and, and we could lose. And consequently, they, they canceled those three missions. And one thing about the Von Brown team, we made something out of all of that extra hardware, as you well know. We came right back and proposed the Apollo Applications Program, we proposed Skylab, and we got uh, some really great uh, science out of that and some, some, some exciting uh, long-duration missions from our leftover Apollo uh, hardware and all that knowledge that uh, we had collected on how to, how to fly manned flights. And when we put up Skylab, which uh, is the best-kept secret in the world, when you look at those three missions that uh, we uh, were, were so successful and, uh, and the, all the science that was gathered from those three missions. I'm really pleased, too, that Deke Slayton got to fly. Uh, and of all things, he got to fly with the Russians, which was kind of a twist because he just, you know, he didn't have anything good to say about Russians. He, as he said, he trained all of his life to go shoot them, yeah. and then he, and he flies with them. But that was a fun, uh, that was a fun mission to watch. Uh, Deke and uh, Vance Brand and, and Tom Stafford uh, flew with their two Russian friends. And that was a successful mission, and it was it was an opportunity to get the two countries together. Yeah. Eventually, we of course have, have begun uh, to be very close in, in spaceflight. After he retired from NASA or left NASA, UAH had some very close relationships with Deke. He was the manager of a number of our UAH rocket flights. That's right. Yes, I and so we dealt with him at in quite some some detail and depth after he left NASA. So he was a he was a true rocketeer. I think he, he was. became a rocketeer more so when he got away from uh, the Houston uh, astronaut program. But you got what you saw when you see when you saw uh, Dick Slayton. That was the real guy, and uh, he was uh, he was a great friend of ours, and uh, certainly a, a, a great believer in what we were doing with young people too in space yeah. camp. I remember one meeting with him when he was with NASA. Uh, he was practicing not moving his head. So all during the conference, he didn't move his head at all. He just moved his eyeballs to follow the conversation going yeah. on. He sat there like a stone <laughs> right. statue, only moving his eyeballs. Yeah. And it was, he, was, he was practicing for it. Yeah, he, he flew until the latter years. He was a true, honest-to-goodness stick-and-rudder man, too. Uh, one of the one of the few that in that Mercury crowd that continued to fly airplanes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he enjoyed the, the old stick and rudder days. Well, in recent times, you've been instrumental in helping organize the Marshall Retirees Association and, and that whole activity. Do you have any remarks about it? Well, you know, I uh, I take a lot of pride in the fact that uh, in this town there's a small group of men and women, and you're one of them, who started out in the manned space flight program. And, and oftentimes the country doesn't realize that this is a small core group of men and women who have a very unique capability. Started out in, in the space business, started out in the missile business, and then became involved in manned flight. And, and we were the first organization to man rate, put a human being on top of a former missile and make that thing work as a space vehicle. And I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I've been associated with, with this group of people and I enjoy working with the retirees and we have a, a nice group of men that uh, all of us getting older now, but uh, at least we're, we're doing our best to uh, save that information and uh, store it and, 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 and hold it for generations of the future to appreciate. And I think that's one of the things I enjoy uh, about being associated with retirees and so forth is being able to uh, do what we're doing now, uh, talk about what, what occurred in those days and uh, remind the younger generation that there's a, there's a legacy here that uh, we're proud of and, uh, you know, our astronauts uh, stood on the shoulders of the men and women in this agency and, and Marshall Space Flight Center and, and went to the moon. And we did it successfully. And we did it a long time ago. And hopefully we'll, we'll see uh, this generation go back to the moon and on to Mars and consequently build on what we've done. But 
I've had a, a, a great time uh, working with uh, retirees, and of course, Space Camp was a, a great opportunity for me to, to deal with young people. And uh, I think we all kind of we gained that or picked that up from Von Braun, who was always talking about the next generation of engineers and problem solvers. He was always wondering uh, where are we going to get them. That's why he, I think that's why he influenced what happened here at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, mm -hmm. is his, uh, his desire to give his people a chance to get a, a, another degree, to extend their knowledge, stretch their mind, and then uh, he, he began to wonder about the younger generation. What are we doing to uh, motivate them and get them excited about space flight? He was a true marketeer, and uh, in addition to being a great rocketeer, he was a great marketeer, and uh, taught us, taught me a lot about communicating with, with uh, young people and, and motivating them to become involved in this business. So I, I you know, I'm, I'm pleased to be a part of that, that uh, the gray beards, uh, <laughs> old, the old timers or whatever, and, and we, we have a good time talking about anniversaries, you know, we, we acknowledge anniversaries of the flights. And that's that's great to do that. We've got uh, a Von Brown Forum coming up in uh, in May. We're going to have here where we're going to bring together the old timers, talk about the days of uh, Apollo and the moon landing, and then uh, sit down with the the younger generation and uh, discuss it with them and and see if we can share some of the lessons learned and and see how uh, it's going to go for the next uh, group that goes to the moon. Are you optimistic about the future? Yes, I am. I I, I become so more so recently with the new administrator of NASA. Uh, I, I feel that there's a, have a, a realistic chance of, of doing it now uh, with, interesting enough, going back and using the Von Braun concept of the building block uh, of, of proven technology and, and equipment that's worked before, repackaging it, uh, putting it in a, in a core line, uh, lined up like it looks like supposed to be a rocket with an escape tower on top. And I think, yeah, I, I feel much better about our chances of getting back to the moon and on to Mars. Well, before we conclude this interview, are there any things we've not asked you about that you'd like to add to the discussion? <clears throat> I think the uh, the Von Brown team is often uh, referred to as a, a group of uh, very uh, well qualified Germans who came to this country and began to develop rockets and did a superb job. But I, I also like to remember that a part of that team a very important part of the team were young men and women who were working in, in different fields at the time Von Braun showed up on the scene and became a part of the team and made a, a great contribution and uh, don't always uh, 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 don't always get the recognition uh, because in, in many cases uh, we had uh, a leadership of, of, of a German uh, rocket team, but beside that, every one of those German rocket team members was an American. And eventually, those American guys and gals became a part of the team that uh, took over and, and sort of uh, learned from, from our German friends. And so, when you say Von Braun, the Von Braun rocket team, it's really a, a broader group of people than, than our friends and from Germany who taught us rocketry, no question about that, and they should, certainly should be credited with that. And, and, and I've had many of my German friends, I, I'm, I'm sure you have too, to express the fact that uh, they sometimes receive more credit, and Von Braun used to say this uh, frequently, uh, that he received more credit. And you know, people don't realize that he would really shy away from that. Uh, he, he just didn't want to be the person who, who got all the accolades. And of course, he showed up on the covers of magazines and all. But he was very, very quick to share that. And, and not just his German friends, but also his new American friends. So I, that's something I, I just wanted to add in my two cents worth. It's a, a tremendous, unique group of, of men and women who have been involved in man's life. And it's small. It really is a small community, even today that understand the, the critical business of flying humans in space. 
you can fly satellites, you can fly robots, and you know you, you can get that done without too much problem. But when you start putting humans on board, it's a whole different ball game. And there's a, a few people that do that for a living. They get up every morning thinking about I'm going to be involved in a manned flight this week. So my hat's off to that group of people. Sometimes they don't always get the credit they should deserve. Well, thank you very much for coming in this morning, and uh, we hope we'll see you again in this context. Thank, thank you very you. much. It's nice to be here.